The Father wanted to reveal His heart as the great and compassionate God every time we've hit the bottom. And God lifts us up out of that miry pit, puts our feet on a rock. We're experiencing the power of the resurrection of our God. Welcome back to our study on Job, my ugly priest. I hope that you are falling in love with him and he'll help you fall more in love with the God that he worships. He's collapsed on us. He's at the bottom, but all through, you'll see, and it's part of life, you know, you, you, he collapses, but he has a rebound. Uh, he'll, he'll go through, now he's about to go to war, uh, and, and most commentators on Job miss this next, uh, we're going to cover chapter 7, uh, it, it's on Job's miserable comforters, uh, but what they are are Satan's secret weapon. Uh, most commentators think, well, Satan's got his tail between his legs. He's been beaten in chapter 1, beaten in chapter 2. Even in Job's collapse, you know, Job is still standing. He's there on Dung Hill. And, and so when I talk about Job being a, a, a handbook on spiritual warfare, uh, people that, that take away uh, that they, they, because Satan is not mentioned by name in the rest of the book of Job. So their, their understanding is he's gone. Well, it's just, it, it, if we didn't have the New Testament, uh, maybe you could come up with that conclusion. I don't know. But because something is silent or hidden doesn't mean it's unreal and not present. And so, Satan's just going to change his tactics. If this didn't work, he's going to come at you this way. You've got to understand that if there's anything about him that you can know is that he is relentless, even in a demented sense. Even when he knows his days are numbered in the book of Revelation, he relentlessly continues to pursue evil. It's who he is. He hates God. And he hates Job because Job is one of God's children, and he hates you. And now, in this chapter, in chapter 4, most people give up in these chapters. And there's a lot of them uh, until God shows up uh, near the end of the book. And it's basically three friends until you get to the end uh, of the book. And then there's this uh, young guy named Elihu who gets six chapters in the book of Job, and he just is full of hot air and pontificates, and he's, he's no different than the three friends that have showed up that are older than he is. Well, one of these friends in chapter 4 has this demonic dream. Now, I call it demonic. There's many Bible teachers, many commentators would say it was the Holy Spirit. They, they, they lack that discernment that is, has unlocked the book of Job. For me, when you begin to see that this uh, Eliphaz, the eldest, has this encounter with a spirit who supposedly gives him these messages to come at Job with, and they're really unsubstantial. They're 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 not deep, but they're they're condemning. They're hopeless. They're degrading. Basically, Job, you're like a moth. You're, you're, you've got no foundation. You're, you've got no hope. You, you, there's no way that you'll ever... It, they're, they're, and I always struggled in these chapters because they're, they're unrelenting. They're, they're dark. They're depressing. They're angry. They're condemning. And I thought, how could God be speaking through people in such a horrible tone? It's because God wasn't speaking through them. Let me help you to see... Go to the end of the book with me, and, and we just want to touch on this is the, 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 the conclusion of the book and Job's restoration, but God's got a word with these three friends, uh, and he says in, in verse 7 of chapter 42, <clears throat> after the Lord had said these things to Job, he says to Eliphaz, now he's the guy that had this supernatural, basically, oh, I had an angel appear to me, or I had this goosebump experience, or I saw this prophecy, and and God says to him, I am 
angry with you. Now, you got to feel this. This is the God of the universe in the face of someone that has been supposedly representing him. I'm angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. First, on a positive thing, God says, my, my son, even though he's, he's at times railed at God, he's been front. God can handle honesty. What he doesn't deal with is insincerity. God can deal with our flawed prayers and our emotions and our passion. What he doesn't deal well with is hypocrisy. God can deal with Job's relentless to almost to a point of, of, of wanting to clear his name at the expense of God's. God can deal with that better than he can the prideful, arrogant way that these friends approach Job. So here's a, a couple tips as you go through this. Write on, in your Bible, it's good to write in, take every chapter of the, the interaction between Job and the friends. Now, some of the verses put their names in, in the first verse, who's speaking, but I found it helpful just to write Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, those are the three uh, friends, and then Job. And then you get to Elihu, it's not complicated, at the end because he has six chapters in a row. And Job never even responds to him. God doesn't respond to him. It's kind of like he pontificates for six chapters. And Job's response was crickets. God's response, crickets. Basically ignoring his, he was a, a blowhard, a windbag, uh, if you will. I think he kind of stands for us warning preachers to, you know, don't be full of hot air. But anyway, these three friends, so write their names over the chapters so you can get a feel who's talking. All the three friends are going to be very similar, but Job will stand out completely different. Not everything that the friends say are untrue. And this is where you have to learn the, the wiles of Satan. Satan takes truths and uses them against them. Satan can take the truth of God's justice, as these friends do, and use it as a weapon to destroy a Christian that has failed. He uses an aspect of God, these friends do, like God's transcendence, that he's exalted above all. 100% true. Wonderful things that they can say about God. Not everything they say is evil in, in a, like a lying sense. There are lies, there are false accusations against Job, and they misrepresent God, but there are things they say about God that are true, but they're wrongly applied. And so you've got to use discretion. There's some beautiful poetry that comes from some of the things that, that, that the friends say in Job. And, and so uh, there, there's some great nuggets. Most preachers skip this. We're not skipping it. And I don't skip it in, in My Ugly Priest. You, you plow through it. Uh, there, it's, 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 it's hard reading sometimes. Stay with it. Look for those kind of categories of, okay, that's true, but it sounds like they're using the truth of God against Job. Or that's just degrading. That's humiliating. That's not the heart of God. That's a, that's a kind of, like, let me give you an example. In chapter 8, verse 1, this is uh, Bildad the Shuhite, which, of course, we know he's the shortest guy in the Bible because he was just a Shuhite. Anyway, I'll spare you any more humor. Bildad the Shuhite, verse 2, he says this to Job now. How long will you say such things? In other words, Job's defending himself. I haven't, I haven't done anything. I, 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 I don't know why. God's mad at me, but I haven't done anything. God, he's holding his integrity. And, he, and, and uh, Bildad says to Job, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. What a great thing to say to someone suffering. They've moved away from the friend category. They're now in a condemner category. They've become weapons, secret weapons. Because it, it, religious people are notorious to be used by Satan to destroy people. You know, I, 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 I watched it the other day. My wife was showing me 
so we have a, a particular uh, movie star that we've met, Kamina, we pray for on a regular basis has come out of great darkness in his life and he, he seems to be moving towards the light. And he posted something online about the Jabez prayer and from his heart, and, and we love the Jabez prayer, it's an Old Testament prayer and yet it can be misapplied, but, but we love the Jabez prayer uh, and we've seen the power of it in our, our lives and in our church. Anyway, he's, he's going off on it, and this religious guy in the feed starts blasting him. Now, here's a guy that's finally naming the name of Jesus, but it's not pure enough for the religious that's poking at him. And it's just, this is the spirit of Bildad. And he says, uh, he says to Job, does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what's right? Now, listen to this. He's, he's basically saying God only does what's right, and then he applies it. This is where they get into Satan's territory. Yes, God, no, God doesn't pervert justice, and God does always do right. But verse 4, when your children sinned against him, they don't know that. That's a false accusation. Nothing in the story said his children were sinning. Nothing in the story said that they'd gone astray. He says when your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. See, they're taking the justice of God and they're destroying Job's heart, making God like this, this brutal dictator that killed his children because he saw some weaknesses in their lives. He says he gave them over to the penalty of their sin, but if you will look to God and plead with the Almighty, if you're pure and upright even now, he will rouse himself on your behalf and restore you to your rightful place. So they're trying to fix Job by destroying him with a God that is angry and has no room for the grace of redemption. Let me help you. When anybody is dealing with a sinful person and they're doing it without grace, then they're misrepresenting the heart of God. Now, you can misrepresent God's heart by being just grace, doesn't matter how you live, sin as ever you want, God doesn't matter. God, no, there is the holiness of God, there is the justice of God, there is the wrath of the Lamb, there, it, it, sin will be punished, uh, there is a place of judgment, but you've got to have the full message. You can't give truth without love. And that's where these guys fail. They become a messenger of the devil. I, I, I remember, I'm sensitive to, to hurricanes because we, we lived through uh, Ian, a category five, 14 hours of hell. And it, it was unknown. It just was life-changing. Uh, PTSD, people were just devastated from the storm. We needed to find Job. We needed to find an ugly priest to give us confidence and hope that God doesn't leave us. Our city looked like Dung Hill. Our city was ravaged and, and smelled and sewer bubbling up. And it was just, a, it was people like zombies. It was just horrible. But, but now, as you begin to see the restoration and you see God bringing good out of the evil, never changes evil, evil. And evil is always evil, but God's the redeemer. He transforms Dung Hill. And so these, these friends that condemn Job and his children, this to me is one of the most horrible atrocities when you tell somebody that their children are dead because God was punishing them. I'm not saying there could never be some form of chastisement or discipline like that, but it's never our place to speak for God and to tell somebody that they're suffering because of, their children are suffering because of their sin. Now, are there times my children have suffered because of my sins? I'm sure that's 100% true. But if you put a blanket statement, as these friends were doing, they're using Job as a whipping post to prove that their theology is right. They're so self-righteous. They have no sense. Look in chapter 13, Job... Uh, one of the places he kind of erupts on these guys in Job 13, verse 1. My eyes have seen all this that they're talking about. I get it. He says, my ears have heard it. I understand it. Verse 2. 
What you know, I know, I'm not in fear. In other words, I'm not going to cower before you because I'm suffering and I'm in a place of weakness. doesn't make you better than me. doesn't make you smarter than me. Job stands up for himself and he says, verse 3, but I desire to speak to the Almighty. In other words, you're get, I'm getting nowhere with you. God, Job always knew that his solution lied with God, not with people. That's where we go wrong. We think people can save us. People can rescue us. People can, you know, we, we need them to, but Job knew his only hope was finding God. He was on a relentless pursuit of finding, and that God that he thought he'd lost was right there with him. And Job says in verse 3, I desire to speak to the Almighty to argue my case with God. You, however, smear me with lies. See, this is the breath of Satan. He smears us with, I don't care how well-meaning these friends are. As someone has called them, uh, or broken people that come and destroy us, and uh, well-intended dragons. These guys are dragons. They're fire-breathing liars. There's not truth in what they're saying, and they're misrepresenting God. And he says, verse 4, he says, you're worthless physicians, all of you. There's no healer. They're not good priests. They have no humility. And then Job says, if only you would be silent. For you, that would be wisdom. Now hear my argument. Listen to my plea from my lips, verse 7. Will you speak wickedly on God's behalf, and will you speak deceitfully? For him? Will you show him partiality? Will you argue the case for God? In other words, you're, you're trying to speak for God. You're trying to make it sound like that uh, you're his representative. So let me just, let's just kind of bring this down to uh, uh, good people can be deceived. Uh, that, that sincere people can be sincerely wrong. Not everything Bible teachers teach is right. Not everything people throw at you with the Bible. You have to use discernment. You have to recognize not just what is said, but how is it said. What's the tone? God doesn't speak in the tone of condemnation. God doesn't speak in the tone of destructive harshness that degrades another that's hurting and suffering. Even when Jesus dealt with the most broken people, he didn't name call them. He didn't tell them that they're suffering uh, uh, for their sin. He, he brought the love of a father. And it, condemnation never changes a heart. You know, threatening people with the, the judgment of God doesn't change a heart. What will change your heart is like the father in the prodigal son story, that when his son came home, he didn't chastise him. He didn't lecture him. He didn't say he deserved to suffer. He, didn't, he wrapped his arms around him and began to kiss him. The, the kisses began to heal the wounds. Even though they were self-inflicted, Job's wounds are being having gas poured on them by these, these secret weapons of Satan. They're, they're, they're meant to be people to help him. They never once offer to pray for him. Never once. Be careful of people that want to argue and pontificate. Sometimes the best thing you can do as, as an ugly priest is just listen cry with the person and say, I can't imagine what you're going through, but can we, can, can we just cry out to God for his help? He understands. God knows. God's here. He needed a priest, not friends to beat him up. Job needed an ugly priest. He needed someone that, that had felt pain in life, someone that knew what it was to fail. Someone, you know, I, I, my wife and I used to get around other leaders that their kids were younger than ours, and they were going through so many victories and their kids were perfect this and virgins and had promised this and they're, you know, and our kids were a mess. They were a little older and we felt like horrible parents. And, and I'm sure I was at, at, in ways, but you, I've known kids that were amazing kids that had horrible parents. It's not always you have great parents equal good kids. It doesn't work that way. Even God, who's the best parent, has had horrible children. So, you know, but in that, that condemnation of others telling us, well, Jamie, if you just did this, don't do that, do more of this, do more, and they give the, that, that doesn't help someone when their kid's away from God. What helps is when you come and cry with them and believe with them and pray with them. And so 
Beware of religious, well-meaning people that are going to destroy you in their misconceptions of who God is, misapplications of what God has said. Beware. Use caution as you listen to people teach the Word of God. Make sure you don't just hear what they're saying, but do you hear the heart behind what they're saying? Even if they're preaching on the judgment of God and hell, it should be with a broken heart. It should be with humility. It should be with the, the passion of, of pleading, don't go there. God says, I'm angry at you guys because you misrepresented me. I hope that that's never said of me. I hope it's never said of you. Let's be humble and careful when we say we're speaking for God. Let's make sure we're ugly priests that walk humbly, kindly, and honestly. We would have no idea what I would do. These guys act like if I was in Job's place, I'd do this. I'd do that. I'd do. Nobody knows what they would do until they've walked in the same place that the other person has walked in. These guys had not walked where Job was walking, and they had no medicine that could help him. They were miserable comforters. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you are the greatest comforter. You sent your Holy Spirit, and you described him as a comforter, an encourager, one that comes to our side and supports us and strengthens us. And so, Lord, we just, just pray that you'll help if there's anybody listening that's been poisoned by wrong teaching or people that misrepresented your heart, uh, Lord, in ways that, that are not honoring to you. Will you liberate them from those things that maybe they believe lies about you, Father? And I just pray that you'll dislodge those lies, heal those wounds. Go on, show up, and, and, and as they share, let there be healing uh, to break free from anything that's not of you that's been put on uh, uh, these folks. Lord, bless them in their time of sharing. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless.